wife requires bending over.
Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And I could have made you sing. I didn't do that. Um, our tune of attention to the announcements. One, we won't have prayer group this week. Um, a big thanks to Cindy Rollins for her donation of my medic kit. It is red. It's a complete first aid kit. We hope we'll never need some of the things that are in there, including tourniquets. But it's right above the, um, the coat hanger stuff out there. So if there is an emergency, we need to all know where it is. And it's bright red. You can't, you can't miss it out there. So thank you for that, Cindy. Um, don't forget that we are trying something different this summer. Through the summer months, we're going to be meeting at 9 a.m., so come join us at 9 a.m. for worship and then stay after for some treats and discussion and fellowship and we hope you can join us. Um, Nancy, do you want to come forward for the Sunday School Teachers? No. No, <laughs> no. You should never put a question like that. Like she can say yes or no. I'm not going to use the mic. I'm sure you can hear me. Uh, on behalf of our session, I'd like to recognize and our Sunday school teachers. Um, and so Pastor Karen and Mary and Miss Peggy is hiding. So she's not here this I, morning. If you if you would come forward, please. Uh, these have been our Sunday school teachers for this year. And um, it I Cindy and I work on the outreach portion of our session um, program together. And I think that this is one of the places that it's the root and the foundation for the spiritual growth and the continued uh, strength of our congregation. And so on behalf of our congregation, we would like to thank you ladies for your help. I'm going to do this first. Yes. Thank you very much. And we have a gift for you. Thank you, Pastor Karen. Absolutely. Thank you for all you've done. I enjoy it. And you can I take one and I'll send one for Peggy. Any other announcements this morning? Please join me on this gorgeous morning in the call to worship. As the deer pants for streams of water, so we long for you, O oh God. We thirst for you, the living God. When can we come to stand in your presence? Through each day, the Lord pours his unfailing love upon us. Through each night, we sing his songs, praying to the God who gives us life. Send out your light and your truth, O oh God. Let them guide us to your holy mountain, to the place where you live. Then we will go to the altar of God, to God, the source of all our joy. Let us pray together. God, we praise you. We gather together to worship you, to remember your goodness and unfailing love. Time after time, you have come to our rescue. Your love has sustained us through good times and bad. No matter what we face, whether accident, illness, disappointment, or death, you were there, encouraging, strengthening, and blessing. Even when we turned our back on you, you didn't abandon us, but waited patiently for us to return, ready to welcome us with open arms. Because we have known your love in the past, we look to the days ahead without fear. No matter what, we will continue to trust in your unfailing love, confident you will guide us in the days ahead, as you have guided us in the past. Amen. All right, let's stand and join together in O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
Our hearts long for God, and we know we fall short of God's glory. So let us now confess to God the ways we have individually and collectively fallen short of God's grace. Please pray with me. God, we confess that we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. You embodied yourself in a human body. You lived out your life among those who were sick, physically, mentally, and spiritually. You reached out to touch them, spoke words to comfort them, performed miracles to heal them. Heal us, we pray, from the sin sickness that grips us. Heal us and help us to work for the healing and wholeness of our neighbors as well. Just speak the word of your peace, and we shall be. Friends, forgiveness comes from God who does not count our sin against us. For God has reconciled us through Christ and entrusts to us the message of reconciliation. Believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's extend the wave of peace to those around us this morning.
This morning's moment for mission is our, we should not forget that we are having our baby shower. And if you look over there, what's one integral thing that people bring to baby showers? Diapers. diapers. How many thousands of diapers does every child use over the course of their infant, infanthood? So please feel free to continue to bring diapers, to bring um, clear laundry soap, wipes, um, either gently used or new clothes. Thank you for that. All right, well, how many of you have ever been out on a boat? How many of you have ever been out on a boat when it's stormy? We did once get stuck on a sandbar in the, Missouri, in the Mississippi River. That was a family story. You ever have one of those stories? Okay. And if you've ever been out in a boat or maybe you've been in a car when a storm comes up and the wind starts to blow and the rain and the thunder come and you want to be where? You want to be home. You think, Lord, can't you just transport me? I want to be home. We know Jesus and his disciples, that's one of our stories today. They were been traveling all around the countryside. They, Jesus had been teaching. He'd been performing many miracles. And when evening came, Jesus said, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And they went on, on the lake and they got in the boat. And Jesus is tired. Um, Matthew doesn't say this, but one of the other gospels implies or says that he gets a pillow which if you get a pillow, you're intending to do what? Sleep. sleep. Okay, if I get a pillow at home, I'm intending to sleep. Okay, he's laying down, he's sleeping, and a storm comes up, and the boat begins to fill with water, and the disciples are afraid, and they said, Lord, don't you care if, that we're going to drown? And Jesus wakes up, and he says to the wind and the waves, silent, be still, and all of a sudden, it is calm. I mean, you know, usually when it's a storm, what happens? It, it's stormy and it gradually, but with Jesus, the moment he speaks, the storm is, it is calm, calm as, as glass. You see, it's just like glass. And he says, why are you afraid? Don't you have faith? And the disciples are like, who, basically like, who, who the heck is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, we all have times that storms come, don't we? We're going along in the boat, life's great, and then all of a sudden there is a storm. And we think, Lord, we are going to drown. And so we shout out to God. Maybe, maybe we make a wrong decision. Maybe other people um, are harming us. And when we face problems, we think, who do we want to have in the boat with us? I hope you say Jesus, right? Or somebody who's really adept at, at boating here, right? You want Jesus because you want him to calm every storm in your life. Let's pray. Lord God, we do know that there are storms in our lives and that sometimes the boat seems to be sinking. And that's when we cry out to you, Lord, and all we need to say is help. And you are there and ready and willing, and you're right beside us. Thank you for that. Thank you for always being in charge and being our God. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the Spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. So I'm going to be reading today from Matthew 8, beginning with Jesus healing a man with leprosy. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleaned of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. The next section is the faith of the centurion. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go. And he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. 
When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Jesus heals many. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. The cost of following Jesus. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus calming the storm. And then Jesus, he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus restores two demon-possessed men. When he arrived at the other side in the region of Gader Gaderans, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what happened to the demon-possessed men. And then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave the region. Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the men, Take heart, son, your, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This man is... This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, Get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to man. The Calling of Matthew. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus is questioned about fasting. 
Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died. But come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to him, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, Go away. The girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowds had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread all throughout all that region. Jesus heals the blind and the mute. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on his son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over that region. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. A journalist photographer was caught in a rain shower when he saw a dark, gloomy house, and when he was drying off, he heard scary sounds, and he heard a as a ghost came toward him. And he grabbed his camera to take pictures. The ghost asked him what he was doing, and he said, I want to take your picture for the newspaper. And the ghost was glad for the exposure, and he posed for the photographer. And when he was out of film, he thanked the ghost and rushed to get the film developed. And when he saw the results, he was terribly disappointed that they all came out black. They were underexposed. The moral of this story is the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. <laughs> now, we are very visual people. We record everything these days. And today, I want you to think of it, I know this is a longer passage, but I want you to think of it as a whole series of snapshots. I think about how um, when people pass away, they make, uh, they make whole video collages, right? Have you ever gone to uh, a a visitation where they only had three pictures in one of those DVDs? No. They're a whole series of pictures. Why? Because they're presenting those whole series of pictures so that you get a whole big picture. And I want you to think about, about these stories the same way. It's a whole set of snapshots. They're taken from different angles. They're taken for different reasons. Which, and they all together tell the story of who Jesus is and what he did. Now, as King Jesus wrapped up his Sermon on the Mount, he already had the fascination of the crowds because of his unique message which held authority. And the crowds followed Jesus down the hill to hear and see more. And what they saw next was 12 astonishing miracles meeting all kinds of human needs. And the outline for these two chapters is there's three miracle stories, there's two descriptions of discipleship, three miracle stories, two descriptions of discipleship, and then three miracle stories. And we see, don't we, that people responded differently to the miracle stories. Some people were in awe and they were amazed. Other people, like the scribes, were like, okay, we are judging you, Jesus. Who the heck are you? And I think as we study these miracle stories, I, I challenge you to think, how do you respond as you see King Jesus 
possesses absolute authority in the world. Now, we think about how do kings typically show their power? I've been reading in my daily reading, I'm to the point where I'm to the kings. Remember how awful the kings were um, of God's people? The kings of Israel and Judah, they often show power. What do they do? They crush their opponents. Um, they wield their power for their own good, their own glory. They think they're all powerful. You've read through the Old Testament. They think they're all powerful, and then boom, somebody else comes along and wipes them and their family off the map. The real power was never theirs. So what a difference we see from the awesome divine power of King Jesus, who uses his power again and again for the good of his people. Charles Swindoll says in his commentary on Matthew, he says, no obstacle is insurmountable, no circumstance is impossible, no situation is unapproachable, no person is unchangeable, and no problem is unsolvable. Should it be his will, God is able to heal any sickness or disease, stop any addiction, and relieve any physical, mental, or emotional affliction. When he doesn't do so, it isn't because he lacks power, but because it isn't his will, which points to the fact that he's also all-knowing, all-wise, and all-good. Not ignorant, foolish, or capricious. No force can resist what he wants to accomplish whenever he wants to accomplish it. No enemy is a threat, and no being, human or demonic, can withstand his sovereign control or alter his will. King Jesus possesses absolute authority in the world. Jesus has authority over disease. The first, the first snapshot here starts with the crowds parting to, sh to show a man with leprosy. Now, although this man should have been shouting unclean, he should have been staying away, he comes toward Jesus as one would come toward a king. He kneels before him, desperate, depressed. This man is confident that Jesus is his only hope, and he is right. It's only a matter of whether Jesus wants to heal him. Now, unlike a normal person who feared leprosy, Jesus didn't take a step back. No, Jesus reached out his hand and he touches him. As with almost every one of his miracles, Jesus performs it in basically an unmiraculous way. He says, with compassion and authority, be clean, and the cure is immediate and it's total. Now, the power in the story here is found in the testimony because the guy's got to go off. He's got to say to the priest, okay, am I unclean? Imagine the priest who examines him and pronounces the healing genuine on the basis of the law. We know Jesus has come to perfect and fulfill that law, and his, his power to cleanse a leper would hint at a more significant power to forgive sin. The Talmud states, cleansing a leper is akin to raising the dead. This, this testimony of a healed leper is a powerful witness to the whole ministry of Jesus. In other words, we're starting off with a really great picture. Okay. So imagine the next snapshot. Can you imagine this? Jesus and his disciples are at Capernaum. They come. Here comes the Roman centurion. Now, when Jesus learns of his predicament, Jesus does something really shocking, and he says to him, hey, Jesus knows that Gen the Jews are forbidden to enter, enter Gentile homes, but he says, hey, I'm willing to go to your house and heal your slave. Jesus is willing to violate a Jewish tradition so that Jesus can offer him mercy and grace. Now, as a leader of Roman century, he understands authority. When he issues an order, when he's given an order, disobedience is not an option. You don't say, oh yeah, I don't feel like doing that. No, when he gives an order, people, people did it. Now this is the only time in Matthew's gospel Jesus is said to be amazed or astonished. It's the healing of the, the slave is kind of an afterthought. Okay, so many times the miracle isn't really the miracle. The true miracle, which amazes even Jesus, is the faith of the Roman soldier. Now, they go 80 feet down a narrow alleyway from the Capernaum synagogue and enter Peter's house. They find Peter's mother-in-law with a fever. We know that to suffer a high fever in the first century was extremely serious. Now, again, it's just a matter of Jesus reaching out. He touches her. The fever leaves. She gets up, she serves Jesus and his companions, and then all of a sudden they've got a flood of people in Peter's mother-in-law's house, people seeking deliverance and healing. Jesus has authority over disciples. Okay, again, click, click, can you, are you visualizing this in your mind? Okay. The de descriptions of discipleship. A guy comes to Jesus and he says, I'll follow you wherever you go, but 
Jesus knows, okay, you don't, you don't know what this is going to cost you. Jesus says, if you follow me, I'm all you've got. You've got to trust purely in me. You've got to be willing to give up security and personal comforts. The second man learns Jesus is worthy of undivided affection. Faith before family is clear in the teaching of Jesus. But in Judaism, family is given priority over faith. Their, their law said basically, if your relative dies, you don't have to worry about saying your scriptures you're supposed to say daily. You don't have to worry about obeying the Ten Commandments. But we know with Jesus, absolutely nothing comes before him. All other obligations vanish when we take up his cross. Now, Jesus has authority over disasters. We talked about in the children's sermon. Jesus and his disciples are on a boat. And literally, okay, imagine this in your mind. This is not, okay, we live in Iowa. We can see a storm coming, right? We would say even more than a mile away. Okay, but they're in a boat, and all of a sudden, it goes from calm to a ferocious storm right away. The word in Greek here means, for storm means violent shaking. Some of these disciples knew this lake, and yet they have never seen a storm like this. And they are going, we are going to die. And yet, picture this, Jesus is just laying there, taking a nap quietly through the killer storm. And they're like, okay, what are you doing? Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, Jesus finds the disciples very afraid. He's, he's, he's disappointed. They're like, are you guys still afraid? And in the same way Jesus rebukes the demon possessed, he speaks to the deadly storm which dies down literally as, as if it's exhausted. It goes, again, from a level 10 to a level 0 like that. Jesus has authority over demons. So they find themselves, the storm has blown them over to the other side of the lake. And here comes two demon-possessed men living in the cemetery. These evil spirits notice that they address Jesus as Son of God. They know they're going to be destroyed, and so they are terrified to see Jesus. And I think, are they afraid because they think Jesus has come back? Come to pay them back for they're trying to murder him and the disciples in the storm? Because this is the storm. There was, a, there was a demonic presence there, right? So knowing Jesus' intention to cast them out, they plead to be sent to a nearby herd of pigs. And Jesus says, go. And the pigs, panicked by the demons, rush into the lake and drown. Can you imagine all those pigs kind of bobbing in the water? Can you see that picture too? Okay. The bodies of the dead animals floating on the lake reveal what the intention of the storm was. Because see, what happened to the pigs is what Satan intended for Jesus and the disciples. Satan intended that Jesus and the disciples would be the ones bobbing on the lake. Now, while we could easily, we say, okay, what about these townspeople? They, they fearfully say Jesus to Jesus, could you just go I think, how would you react if you were there? In Matthew's gospel, King Jesus several times tells those close to him, don't, don't be afraid. Now, Jesus has authority over sin. This story tells us Jesus' authority penetrates to the root of all suffering, which is sin. That sin can be in your life, as sin you've committed, or it's sin in the world. And these men bring a man to Jesus, and Jesus sees the faith there, and he says, have courage, your sins are forgiven. To be healed, think about it this way, to be healed and to be forgiven are two sides of the same coin. Sin represents the worst kind of paralysis. Don't get me wrong here. This doesn't mean all sickness is the result of personal sin. We know lots of people who are sick, and they didn't do anything to cause that, okay? But to demonstrate his authority, Jesus commands the paralyzed man to get up, and the crowd praises God while the scribes are offended by Jesus exercising this kind of authority. Now, we know Jesus has the authority to save even in the case of tax collectors. Jesus goes, I love this, he goes and he pursues a sinner like Matthew. And he says to him, okay, you've got you to leave your post, you've got to leave your position, you've got to leave your possessions. Tax collectors were, were usually fairly wealthy because there was so much room for profit in their business. Think about this is a sacrifice. Now, does Matthew go off and he goes, oh, I have to give it all up? No. He's so excited that he does what next? He's so excited to be following Jesus, he throws a banquet. Because I'm going to have a party at my house, a feast for sinners. Now, the Pharisees say, what are you doing? 
You're supposed to be ignoring sinners. They don't get that Jesus has come to heal the sick. The Pharisees are sick too, but they're blind to their sickness. That's why right now they're, they're outside of the ability of Jesus to heal them for the present. Which brings us to the last of the three miracles. Click, click. Are you still click? Are you still seeing the pictures in your mind? Okay. All right. I know. We don't really take pictures with cameras like that anymore, do we? Let's just pretend, all right? Do you ever find one of those disposable cameras at your house every once in a while? This is a totally different thought. But you go, what am I supposed to do with those, right? With those, you go, click, click. Okay. So the last three miracles, Jesus has authority over death. Jesus is speaking to John's disciples about fasting, and here comes one of the leaders. He kneels down in front of Jesus. He is frantic because his young daughter is, is dead, and he believes Jesus is his only hope. And here goes Jesus, his disciples in tow, and a woman who has suffered for, from bleeding for 12 years comes up behind Jesus in the crowd. I like this picture. Isn't that a cool one? And hearing about Jesus, she's come to this magical conclusion. If she just touches the fringe of his prayer shawl, she will be healed. And in her mind, the power is in the cloak that is touching Jesus. And Jesus turns around and he discovers her behind him. And he tells her it was her faith that healed her. And this healing changes, it changes everything. Uncleanliness no longer radiated from her to Jesus. Healing comes from Jesus to her. Now, arriving at the leader's home, Jesus says, she's not dead, she's sleeping, and they don't get Jesus. So it's that old wineskins can't contain the new wine, and they erupt, they laugh. Can you imagine Jesus coming, and they just laugh and laugh and laugh like she is dead. What are you talking about? And Jesus takes her by the hand, and he wakes her up. He brings life in the midst of death. See, with Jesus, death is temporary. The one who has authority over disease, natural disasters, demons, the one who has severed the root of all suffering with his authority over sin has authority over death itself. And that authority is going to ultimately, remember how I said we should be, when we're talking about Matthew, we should be seeing the cross in the background? It's going to be shown when Jesus dies on the cross. We know Jesus was really dead for three days. And he walked out of the tomb on his own authority. King Jesus shattered even the authority and finality of death. Jesus has authority over disability. Eager to see these two blind men cry out to Jesus, have mercy on us, son of David. That's the first time in Matthew that someone besides Matthew calls Jesus the son of David. Even in their blindness, these guys can't see physically. But they're able to see what the Pharisees the scribes, the teachers of the law around them couldn't see. Jesus is the one they've been waiting for. Finally, Jesus has authority over the devil. This demon-possessed mute man comes to Jesus. Now, again, I want to be clear that having a disability, having an illness, it does not mean that the person is possessed by the devil. But if we go back, remember Matthew points us back to the Old Testament and back in, in Isaiah 35, it says the Messiah would usher in a new day, and in his kingdom the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will leap, and the mute will sing for joy. Jesus is doing all that and more. Jesus has authority over sin, death, and the devil himself. And we can rejoice in Jesus' promise for eternity. Satan will be destroyed. King Jesus possesses absolute authority in the world. I want to close with a little story here. I think this is funny and sad all at the same time. You can make up your own mind. So what should have been a routine traffic stop, this is a true story, escalated into so much more. It happened in Oklahoma. Picture this. A 65-year-old Deborah Hamill was pulled over by a police officer for a broken taillight. And when the officer respectfully and cordially gives her the $80 ticket, she refuses to sign it. She says, why should I pay for something that I can easily fix? although she hadn't fixed it for six months. Now, when the officer tells her to get out of the car, she swears at him, she rolls up her window, and she drives away. So what does the cop do? You want to guess? He follows her, ready, pursues her, okay? After a police chase, she ends up pulling over, but again, she refuses to get out of the car. So he pulls her out, she kicks him, and so he tasers her, okay? Then he arrests her, and guess what her next stop is? Jail, yes. 
She's charged with assaulting a police officer, which is a what? Felony. Oh, we're really good today. Okay. The police officer accomplished his mission, but he wasn't happy about it because it was all over an $80 fine for a broken taillight. Now, I think her actions illustrate an important principle. Things can only go from bad to worse when we reject authority. Think about this. Everybody on the planet has two choices. You can accept or reject the authority of Jesus Christ. And similar to the police officer, Jesus is on a mission. He is here to save us from the consequences of our rebellion, which we would also call sin. King Jesus possesses the absolute authority in the world. And having seen all these snapshots, just like people who traveled with Jesus, we are personal witnesses of who he is and what he can do. And as you look back over the miracles with Jesus in Matthew 8 and 9, which person do you identify with the most? Where do you need the authority of Jesus in your life right now? As we face hard situations in life, let's trust wholeheartedly in the authority of Jesus. Let's rest peacefully in the authority of Jesus. Let's submit completely to the authority of Jesus. Let's rejoice gladly in the authority of Jesus. So the question today is, will you accept the, the absolute authority of Jesus? Amen. As we come to a time of joys and concerns, are there joys and concerns to be shared this morning? Yes, Roger, please. You want to talk? Come on up. Come right here. Good morning, everyone. Couldn't help but notice today's sermon was about healing and miracles. So a few weeks ago, a lot of you prayed for me. Um, May 4th, I had a stroke. And my lowest point was no motion in my left arm, uh, bad speech, and uh, my, my face was dripping pretty bad. Uh, the, I got to the hospital, got help in time. By midnight, I was in Omaha. And uh, by noon the next day, I was walking down the hallway without any help and had pretty much full motion back in my arm. And today I don't feel any um, side effects from the, what I went through. So I had to say thank you for what for your prayers and uh, my second chance. Roger, thank you. You know what? I love when God plans things better than you do. Have you ever noticed that? Because that is, you know what that was? Click, click. Did, did, you see, did you hear it? Click, click. It's just a snapshot that goes perfectly with that. Bless you, Roger. Thank you for sharing that. And God is good all the time, isn't he? We are, we are thrilled for you and your family, Roger. Thank you. Are there other joys and concerns to be shared this morning? We have one more. Yes. Rob is home. Oh, yay! Rob is home. Wonderful. Just for a few days? Yes, Rob has been in Guam for quite some time, and that is, okay, I don't even know how many hours off, like a whole, most of a day. So I'm sure he's totally confused on what day you're on or what day we're on. So blessings that he is home. That's great. Yes, Ron. Kevin Hale pass, passed away. Is that what you're saying, Ron? Yes. Yes, yes Thursday. Yes. 
We'll be praying for him and his family. Are there others, others today? Yes, Trudy. Yes. Thank you for that, Trudy. Denny Reynolds, yes. Did he do Cowboy Church? Yes. The Rev. <laughs> There's only one person who ever calls me Rev, and that's Richard Trinity. So if you know Richard Trinity, so <laughs> he says Rev, and I say Doctor. And <laughs> anybody else? We'll be praying for for Denny's family too. Anyone else this morning? Friends, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Holy and gracious God, you reveal yourself to us again and again. And I thank you that you've revealed a part of you about your ultimate authority to us in these snapshots this morning in your beautiful word. I thank you for the gift of Roger's testimony. And I thank you for the healing touch that you placed upon him. And I thank you for all the ways that you are with each of us every day. And I ask that you just continue to, to teach us who you are and to teach us to be grateful for the blessings and the miracles that you bestow upon us. Thank you for that. Lord, we thank you today for gathering us together at this, in this congregation. We thank you for not only this physical church building, but for the body of Christ which gathers here and the body of Christ which is worshiping all over the world today. And we thank you for that. We thank you and praise you for all the college and high school graduates. We pray that you be with them as they take the next steps in their journey. We lift up to you and thank you that Rob is home from Guam for a few days and ask your, your blessing upon his time here with his family. Lord, we have much to be grateful for and we ask again that you would teach us to have grateful, abundant hearts, that all of us would share how you have been so good to us and how your authority has made all the difference in our lives. Lord, we know that there are other, many others who are in need of your tender, loving care today, and we, we lift up to you those who are grieving this day. We especially think of the Kevin Hale family, the Denny Reynolds family. We know there's others who are grieving today, and we, we ask that you surround them with your comfort and your peace. We lift up to you those who are struggling with cancer. We think of John, Mike, Maggie, Mo, Shelley, and Vanessa. We know that there are others who are in need of your tender, loving care and your healing touch. We think of those with serious illness. We think of those with Alzheimer's and ALS, depression, bipolar, any mental health um, conditions. We lift up to you, Abby. We think of our church members in nursing homes. We think of Merrill and Merlin, for Danny and Barb, for Dolores, William and Jean. We continue to lift up to you, Ed Keppel, as he heals. We again thank you and praise you for the healing of Roger. And we ask, Lord, that if there are any worries upon us today, if there are any burdens that we need lifted, any ways that we need to have to know that your authority rules, we just take them off of our shoulders today, Lord, and lift them silently to you. Lord, you are a gracious and awesome God, and we thank you that you are ours and that there is never a moment that you do not hear and respond to our prayers. We lift them all up to you now in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come with joy to bring forth our tithes and offerings to our God this day.
let us pray. God, you've been incredibly generous to us, and we thank you that you've invited us to be your hands and your feet in this world. Help us to do just that by not only our giving of our money and our resources, but by giving of our time and our very selves. In your precious name we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing together, Oh Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. I want to say an extra thanks to Tony and Ocell here. You two have done a very nice job. I appreciate that. And now receive God's blessing. Now to him who is able to, to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. We are one in the 